Joining us now, Avril Benoit, Director of Communications for Médecins Sans Frontières, and we welcome you to TVO, Avril. Thank you. How are you doing? I'm good. Okay. Thank you. You had a good time at MESH? It was good. Yeah, good conference? Enjoyed it. Uh, we're going to talk about the power of social media here and how you guys are all over that, particularly as it related to the disaster in Haiti. And to that end, let's play some tape off the top here and see MSF in action. Michael, roll tape, please. The volume of the operation in Haiti corresponds to what has happened uh, with this earthquake, and it can be translated into uh, impressive figures. Today, after three months of activity, we have now taken in charge 92,000 patients. We have performed 5,000 surgical interventions. We are managing seven hospitals, six rehabilitation centers. We have 1,200 hospitalization beds, meaning that more than 3,000 international and local staff are working today uh, within MSF teams in Haiti. Okay, a lot of numbers there and uh, some more numbers that I want to share as well. You did $13 million from 50,000 donors for Haiti alone. How does that compare to other disasters that you've been involved in? Well, the closest the organization uh, would ever have had to such a, a global outpouring of generosity uh, would have been the tsunami. Uh, but even in the tsunami where the money came in so quick, I mean, the shock of the story, huge wave coming over uh, the people of Banda Aceh and other places uh, absolutely overwhelmed, um, houses destroyed, uh, loss of life massive in one shot. Um, the money came in so quickly that it's, at a certain point we had to recognize that this problem for the tsunami was not so medical uh, mm -hmm. as it was about infrastructure, housing, uh, repairing fisheries and all these kinds of things. The difference for Haiti is that it was, it was a highly medical response that was necessary. The people who were under those uh, crumbled buildings and survived required trauma surgery. Uh, there were amputations that were performed, a lot of bandaging, uh, bandaging. There, were, there were any number of medical procedures. And, and let's not forget that babies continued to be born that night of the earthquake. And we ran uh, a huge obstetrics hospital that, that was you know, the main center for high-risk pregnancies. And so uh, the work just continued with all the people that we had on the ground. Of course, they deployed quickly. And people, I think, in Canada and around the world recognized that we were in a, a very specific position to do a lot of good. How'd your website handle the traffic with that initial response? Well, in the f first few days, uh, it doubled in terms of uh, our comparison with the numbers of, of, the, of the tsunami. So we had m more visits, twice as many. And at that point, we stopped counting because the server failed us. Couldn't handle and, uh, it. And people who would visit our website, uh, msf.ca, would land on, on, on you know, the, the error message uh, from the web. And of course, it was, it was terrifying for us because we knew that people were looking to, to support us. Mm. Uh, they were looking for information. They were looking for information uh, about their loved ones, you know, hoping to find out which neighborhood had a hospital, where the response was. We had a lot of video and content, and it, we just couldn't. Uh, handle the load. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I'm happy to report that we have since rectified this. We have uh, a stronger <laughs> server now to, uh, to handle what we hope it never happens, which is an emergency of this kind of scale again. But one um, of the things I guess the Haiti disaster pointed out was that when the message gets out there, people watch television, they see this kind of thing happen. You folks use social media and the response can be unprecedented. Eh? How, do, how, how did that happen? There's no question uh, that because our website, uh, and even the international website, which is msf.org, it also was having the same kind of problems, where you would land on it, not get the information you wanted. We had to find alternative routes. And over the years, we've been honing our interaction in the social media sphere, um, Twitter, Facebook, uh, even doing uh, webinars, which are live interactive uh, info sessions on the web. These are all things that were part of our, our palette of communications tools. It all started with the blogs where we recognized, well, these bloggers like James Mascalic, uh, the author of Six Months in Sudan, which is a book that, that, that came from a blog, he was so popular. Uh, and part of the, the exchange with the, the public were, were in the comments. So you'd have the, the blog posting and then these comments coming back and forth. And we recognize as an organization that we cannot shut ourselves off. Uh, we are funded by the generosity of individuals. Uh, and we need to be open, accountable, transparent, not only to those donors, but also to the people that we're trying to help mm -hmm. in, the, in the countries that, that we're working in operationally. Did you have much of a social media strategy before Haiti? Well, I'll tell you, we, we did in terms of the big picture, but nothing specific to Twitter. Twitter 
came so fast. Um, we had some experience of it when we had an abduction in Darfur more than a year ago. A Canadian nurse was involved. Mm -hmm. And we, we did find ourselves often cor correcting misinformation that was out there circulating. So we were, we were sort of getting a handle on the very specific language of Twitter. And the basics of it, in short, is that if you're putting yourself out there, it's not one way. It's two way. Mm -hmm. And it keeps going. And it's a real conversation. And so for us in Haiti, there was no question that right away we turned to Twitter to start saying, we're on the ground. Here's what's happened. Some of our staff is missing, but we're working. And you know, just bit by bit, we were able to, to, to get information out there, which of course in that, in that particular culture gets spread. So people see uh, there's a terrible tragedy in Haiti. They want to do something. What can they do? Well, they can help us spread the message. Well, here's one of the messages that got spread that was extremely influential, and I'll ask you about it. Uh, this was Ann Curry, who tweeted the following. To the U.S. military running Haiti's airport, find a way to let Doctors Without Borders planes land. And she tweeted that, and it was retweeted, I guess, over a hundred times. What was that all about there? She has a million followers. She's got a million followers. She's a, wow. She's a, she's a celebrity <laughs> as a journalist. The CNBC anchor. She, yeah, she, has, uh, she has seen MSF's work. She's followed our teams, knows us well, trusts us, knew we were working there. And when somebody like that takes on board uh, the problem we were having, where we had these cargo planes that were circling with permission to land, in theory, at the Port-au-Prince airport, um, but then told, no, we're not going to let you land. But those planes had an inflatable hospital um, that would have allowed us to do trauma surgery right away. It, I mean, our, our physicians were running out of saws. We didn't even have the basics at, at a certain point because we had run out of all our emergency supplies. We needed that cargo to save lives in those early hours. So when she tweeted that out, uh, her followers took it upon themselves to bombard the U.S. Air Force. What did they do? Um, and so then they had to engage. They had a Twitter presence. And they started to, to, to receive all these messages and realize that there was something going on. Now, after a few days, when the planes finally were able to land, and of course the U.S. Air Force was to, the first to say so, um, to say, yes, don't worry, folks. <laughs> everything's all right. The, the planes are landing, and everything's all right, because the others had been rerouted to Dominican Republic. Um, what, it, what happened was that credit was given to all that Twitter advocacy. Hmm. But behind the scenes, even Ann Curry, the journalist who instigated really torquing this out into Twitter, she was picking up the phone, calling her contacts at the Pentagon. She called Ban Ki-moon. She called all the major officials. Hmm. There was a lot of quiet diplomacy uh, going on, not just between her, but of course us bilaterally. Government officials from different governments were getting involved. So, well, while while Twitter think. got the credit, yeah. we, we recognized there was a lot of there were a lot of factors, and frankly, it was a small airport that was overloaded. So this is what we really want to get to the bottom of here, you know, because even tw obviously Twitter has its place, and it's had some examples where it's been extremely influential, um, and and I guess Twitter is taking some much of the credit for having got those planes on the ground and having got services to people. Yeah. But it doesn't sound like, from what you're telling me, that it was ex certainly not exclusively responsible for the no. progress made here. I would not say so. Uh, it contributed, we like to think. Mm -hmm. And certainly all those people who are retweeting and, <laughs> and doing the advocacy, they like to think that, um, that it had a lot to do with really moving things. Okay, once you're on the ground in Haiti responding to this disaster, how was social media, how were social media used at that point in the, in the story? Well, there were a number of things going on. So first of all, uh, people were asking us questions. Are you working here? Are you working there? That's good, because we could answer. This was an opportunity for us to get little snippets of information out to give our location, and also to educate the public. The truth is, it's not through Twitter that you should do humanitarian logistics and planning. Occasionally, we would get questions, for example, around, um, there's a woman I hear screaming under this building. It would be people in Haiti. Uh, can you rescue her? And these kinds of questions. There's a, there's a child needs medical care. Uh, and it's on, uh, the child is at this location. Now, we're working in 19 up to 26 different locations, depending on the timing. Uh, bring the child to the hospital. 
So Th you could that would be better you can't than tweeting to, it. Well, no, I'm the communications yeah. person. Yeah. What am I going to do with this information? Uh, pass it on individually to to our operations teams. I, it's it's very difficult. And and certainly what we recognized also, even about the thing with the plane landing, is that this is not the way really to prioritize uh, the 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 response because then it's the loudest voice that. Uh, gets the action, gets gets the mobility, gets the access, and the, and this is not really how the professionals in the aid sector who are experienced with emergency response would want to be working because it's just a lot of noise, right. and so for us to take shield them from a lot of that through our activity of responding to the questions, of being there, um, reporting from the ground. I was the emergency communications coordinator, so I was tweeting what I was seeing, what we were going through. Uh, you know, that's good because it, it, it in some ways buffers them from the relentless pressure. And how do you deal with, I mean, one of the downsides of Twitter is that, of course, misinformation, not just good information, but misinformation gets passed along as well. How did you deal with that? It's tricky because we did have to uh, try to correct it bit by bit, and that means constantly trolling and searching. There are companies now who will sell services to troll and search for you. Um, but we weren't organized that way yet. Uh, I think now that we've had the experience and seeing how, how fast it grows, we have to have those analytical tools and, and just the, the ability to know who's saying what because your material is also going out there. You post a video on your website and you post it on YouTube because that's where people go to watch videos. Sure. They will post it on their blog. It mm. goes all around. It, it really can go viral that way, which is good. And it means that as an organization um, that is normally very much in control of its communications, about, uh, about its voice, um, because we use it strategically sometimes, um, it, it, it meant giving up a degree of control. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in our last couple of minutes here, tell me the, the, the key lessons that your organization learned in Haiti using social media were what? First of all, jump in right away and with two feet. And that means if you're going to do it, keep doing it. Uh, thank people when they help you out, when they retweet or spread uh, your material uh, in, in a positive way. Uh, when they have questions, uh, there is no stupid question. It's an opportunity. Seize it. Um, and when there are things to be corrected in the media, seize the opportunity to be out there and say, look, folks, uh, let's not get too excited. Here's what's going on. Um, it's an opportunity, but it requires real sincerity when it comes to the, the interaction. Uh, it's a conversation that you're agreeing to be part of if you're in that space, and uh, no longer just having your website and expecting people to come to you. You have to go where they are. Sure. Now, as is inevitably the case, the next, the last disaster is always, you know, never that far away from the next disaster and the next one after that. So Haiti is not obviously on the front pages anymore the way it was when this transpired. What role can social media play right now to remind people that even though the media have moved on to the next disaster, you know, these people still need help. This is not over yet. This is a long way from being over. Even when Haiti was going on, there were any number of crises uh, that we were working in, that we were seeing. Things going on in, in Democratic Republic of Congo, things going on in Somalia, horrific things that deserved attention. But because Haiti took up so much space, um, it, you know, the opportunity wasn't there. And what we would say of Haiti is that we worked so many years to put Haiti on the map. We hope that, uh, that the media that now started to pay attention because of the earthquake will continue to feel an engagement because people who go there and who, and who really do pay attention to what's happened there over the years leading up to this crisis and, of course, what's happening right now, we hope that they maintain that, that commitment and concern. Um, social media, how can they help? Well, I mean, it's, it's just keep doing what they're doing. Mm -hmm. and just. Just try to, to use it for good. And a lot of people are willing to. They want to help in some way. And maybe they can't help with a financial donation. And they're not going to sign up for a nine-month tour of duty as an aid worker uh, with Médecins Sans Frontières or mm -hmm. Doctors Without Borders or other organizations. And this is their way uh, to express their concern and to actually act on it. Gotcha. Avril, thanks so much for coming in today. Appreciate your time. Thanks. Appreciate it, too.